Good morning, and welcome to distinguished guests, faculty, 2009 graduates and their parents, who are gathered for the sixth annual Amrita University Convocation. It is remarkable that within only six years, Amrita has grown to 14,000 students at five campuses, offering degrees in engineering, medicine, business, biotechnology, nanotechnology, education, and arts and sciences. I understand that in 2003, there were only 100 graduates, and today there are 2,800. I have come to believe that Amrita students have a special place in the world, as I will explain. I am sure that every graduating class on the face of the earth has been told that they are entering a world different than the one their parents experienced. This has always been true, but never more true than today. The world may not be flat, but it is small, and the human population of 6.5 billion is challenging the ability of this planet to support human life. There are already many areas in the world where the basic necessities of life are deficient, fresh water, nutritious food, clean air, etc. At the same time, science is reaching new insights daily and technology is translating those insights into powerful applications. There is no question in my mind that we have the scientific and technical competence to create a world that sustains human life for you, your children, and their children, and can provide a meaningful and fulfilling life for each human being. Amrita University has recognized these challenges in forming a Center for Environmental Studies. The Center promotes sustainable development and works to create awareness among people regarding equitable use of natural resources. Sustaining the Earth's resources will require a new science. Science uncovers the relationship between things, and when we get it right, allows predictions of the future, and permits technological interventions that can change things in a favorable direction. The science of sustainability is far more challenging than traditional science for two reasons. First, these problems are complex and therefore not subject to precise solution. Second, Traditional science removes people from the system under study, but with sustainability problems, we are part of the system. People's values, motives, and behaviors interact with the physical world to influence outcomes. The problems we face involve all the complexity of the planet and human society. We are not alone in our need to solve complex problems that defy precise prediction. Indeed, this is the type of problem that all living systems encounter in trying to succeed in this world. We might profitably, therefore, look to biology for lessons in how to deal with complex problems where the information is insufficient and the environment is constantly changing. I will share a simple example with you today, how bacterial cells find their food. Bacteria have to find their way to a food source that is diffusing in three dimensions and in which the environment is likely changing. Here's how they do it. They are born with an algorithm for finding food. They move forward in a straight line for about one second and then tumble around in space, eventually to set off in a random new direction. If they determine that the concentration of food is increasing as they proceed forward, they inhibit this tumbling and go forward for a longer period of time. This process allows them to keep trying new solutions and to reinforce the solution that works. It's very empirical. But here is something very surprising. Even in the face of success, after an extended movement toward food, they tumble again and proceed in a random direction. 
The end result is that the population of bacteria move in the right direction at about 10% the rate of their maximum individual speed. I have to presume, after three billion years of natural selection, that they use the optimum strategy. I think this could be our algorithm for dealing with complex problems. First, know what you want. Start in a random direction. If you are sensing success, continue for a while. But even in the presence of success, try another direction. Keep at it. Be satisfied with slow progress, because there is no perfect solution to complex problems. There are two crucial steps in applying this algorithm. First, you must know what you want. And second, you must be able to measure if you are succeeding. So what is the measure of success? If you think about it, the ultimate goal of all sustainability efforts is human health. Here is a problem. We are not very good at measuring health. The current consensus view of progress in our world seems to be increasing gross domestic product, GDP. This thinking is what has led to our current environmental problems from overexploiting our non-renewable natural resources. I notice that Amrita has a school of traditional healing, and they define health in the following way, and I quote, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity." Unquote. Notice it doesn't say anything about increasing GDP. One of my primary research interests is in finding better molecular and cellular measurements of health and disease. And I like the idea of including mental health and social well-being in the definition. The challenge for human society is that we must not only find the optimum scientific and technical solutions to our environmental problems, but, me, but we must convince all the other humans to change their behavior and implement national and international policies that enforce good behavior. I think the policy part of the solution is going to be harder than the science and technology part. If you are not a scientist, you may be thinking that you have no role to play in these global problems other than being a responsible citizen. But that is not true. As an educated member of society, you have a key role, a decisive role. The policies that are set by governments and international agencies will ultimately determine how we deal with the problems facing the planet. These policies require the explicit consent of the electorate in democracies and the implicit consent of people in autocracies. This consent is built from a shared understanding of the problems and their solutions. Scientists can study the issues and make recommendations. Government officials and their support staffs will study these recommendations and consider how to put them into laws. Journalists will educate the public as to the issues and their nuances. Educators will prepare the next generation to play their part. Lawyers will adjudicate the laws. And the vast majority of people working in corporations will need to assure that their companies are complying with responsible behavior. The point is, there will be no segment of society, no job, that does not require understanding the perils we face and how to play a productive role in their solution. We can take encouragement from the fact that we not only have robust science and technology, but that we as a world have been successful in implementing effective global policy. I refer here to the Montreal Protocol. In 1973, chemicals called chlorinated fluorocarbons were being produced in large amounts for refrigeration. In 